Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. If you saw my uh, vlog from last week, uh, which was the 8-bit Battle Royale Round 1, I uh, pitted uh, three different 8-bit computers against each other to generate a very low-res Mandelbrot set fractal. And the response from that was really extraordinary. My intention was that after that, I would do a round two where I would take those uh, three platforms, the Commander X-16, the Commodore 64, and the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, and just do it again, but this time doing it in assembly language for all three. And that was going to be round two. But it became very apparent in the, the comments and the, the response uh, from that video. It was uh, really quite extraordinary. A lot of people really uh, enjoyed that, got very engaged in the competition and the technicalities. And of course, that's that's what the folks that subscribe to my channel like. And if you're not one of those subscribers, and this is the kind of thing you like, by all means, click that subscribe button and, uh, and make sure you like and comment this video. It lets YouTube know that this is the kind of thing you like, and we'll get more for it, <laughs> more of it for you, all right? So let's go and uh, do what, what these folks really wanted us to do, which was not, we're not just going to stop at those three. We need to do a bunch more classic 8-bit computers and see how they stack up. And, of course, there was uh, folks that were wondering, well, what about this Sinclair ZX Spectrum Next, which is the, the modern recreation of the uh, uh, classic ZX Spectrum? Kind of how the Commander X-16 is sort of a reimagining of the Commodore 64 for the modern era. And we saw with the Commander X-16 that you got like almost nine times the performance of the Commodore 64 for generating the same fractal. So, well, are, are we going? How are we going to see a better performance <laughs> from the the next compared to the X16? Well, we'll we'll see. We're going to actually uh, try out that. We're going to try out the uh, Amstrad CPC 464 computer, uh, another classic uh, British microcomputer. We're going to try a couple of uh, Americans uh, because, you know, we got to try to land on both sides of the pond here. We're going to get the uh, Apple II and the Atari 800. And then back on the other side of the pond, the uh, very prestigious and uh, so somewhat, uh, you know, mythically uh, expanded <laughs> BBC Micro, which was a, a very high-end 8-bit computer that British school children actually got to have uh, in their classroom, whereas in America, most of us had Apple IIs. And the BBC Micro, very, very capable and uh, complex machine. But is it going to be any faster than any of the others? Well, let's get right to it. But first, let's take a, a little recap of what happened last time. So uh, just as a reminder, in this first round, we are just using the native or at least the most common uh, basic interpreter available for these systems. So the basic program that I created for this was based on the Wikipedia uh, pseudocode algorithm for generating a Mandelbrot set. Very brute force, very straightforward. And so it's not necessarily efficient, but the, the point is not to be efficient for this exercise. The point is to try to determine performance. And uh, by doing this brute force method, of course, as expected, the Commander X-16 came out ahead and managed to generate this uh, fractal in only 23 seconds. Now, granted, this is not a very high resolution fractal. We are talking about a uh, 32 by 22 uh, fractal. Uh, so big, <laughs> thick, chunky pixels. In fact, uh, each pixel is really eight by eight pixels. So we're, uh, we're dealing with a, a very chunky looking Mandelbrot set. So then who came in second? Well, that was the Commodore 64. It was actually more than eight times slower than the Commander X-16. It was uh, coming in at three minutes and 23 seconds. And uh, bringing up the rear was the old Specky who took a full four minutes and 33 seconds. And a, a lot of that can be explained through uh, just the uh, peculiarities of the system. So uh, first of all, uh, the Spectrum has a three and a half megahertz 
uh, CPU, uh, but it's a Z80 CPU. And the Commodore 64, even though it's just about one megahertz, uh, it is using a 6510. And uh, you can't really compare a cycle on a 6510 to a cycle on a Z80 because you're, you're getting a lot more instructions happening uh, per cycle on the, uh, on the 6510 compared to the Z80. The Z80 instructions generally take lots of cycles to get through. So you're, you're not really getting that much of a faster machine. And uh, to compound that issue is you're also dealing with a basic interpreter that is not well-tuned to this sort of problem. And uh, we're going to see uh, that uh, reflected in a lot of these, although uh, most of these systems have a, a, a basic interpreter that was developed by Microsoft and then tweaked for their particular system. Uh, you're going to definitely see differences in implementation in basic because the, the basic programs for each of these are all pretty much the same. But <laughs> things get a, a little hairy under the hood. So let's... Uh, Let's take a look at, at what we got here. All right, so for the Spectrum Next, what you, we use here is a Sarix, and I use a Fuse normally for the original Specky, but that uh, doesn't support the Spectrum Next. I have to use the Sarix, kind of like how I did in some of my uh, earlier uh, videos. <laughs> and uh, so what I can do is uh, load up this uh, Next Mandelbrot as ESF. This is in the repo. Uh, the GitHub link is in the description, and you can get all of this code to run for yourself on your own uh, computer, <laughs> all right? Or your emulator, however you want to do it. Of course, these uh, snapshots work better on the emulator. So there we go. So there's the program. It's the exact same program that was running on the uh, original Specky uh, Fuse emulation. So what I have to do now is uh, run it. And the nice thing about this Spectrum is it, it was easier to type it into here because I could actually just type like a normal human and not have to have this cheat sheet and figure out which letter got which keyword. I could just type out the keywords like on every other computer in the world. <laughs> so, And even to do run, I have to type out R-U-N. And that's okay. I, I can deal with that. So let's run it. Let's see how it goes. And you can see already that this is not running any faster than the original Specky, and that's because that's that's what it's emulating. It's emulating a, a three and a half megahertz Z80. So if we're going to speed it up, we got to go here into the settings and bring up the turbo. And there we can see. Now it's running at almost the same as the ZX Spectrum, or uh, or like eight times the ZX Spectrum, and and really that that is what it's doing. It's exactly eight times faster than the Specky, and uh, because of the peculiarities of this uh, emulator, I I can't uh, have it starting at turbo mode. But what you can very plainly see is that uh, at the maximum turbo, it is just running eight times faster. And so you're going to get something that is still not quite as fast as the Commander X16. Because with the original Specky running at 4 minutes and 33 seconds, so that means running at 28 megahertz, which is 8 times the original speed, that you're going to still take a full 34 seconds to run through this program. And so, yeah, we're still uh, a, quite a bit faster with the Commander X16. So I think that pretty much settles it for the next is we can still use the original spectrum as the uh, the standard and then just do that divide by eight to get the speed for the next. Uh, of course, the next has additional graphics modes. We're not going to necessarily look into using some of these advanced graphics modes in the next round. We're still going to be sticking with this resolution. And as you can see, by default, the uh, uh, Spectrum Next has the uh, original classic ZX Spectrum uh, graphics mode. And so there we have it. That's uh, that's the Spectrum Next. So we're not going to leave the Sarix just yet because uh, it was also used to emulate a, another platform that we are going to test, namely our friend the Amstrad CPC 464. So we just switch our machine 
Go over to Amstrad. Now, of course, uh, a little bit of history. Amstrad actually bought the rights to the uh, Spectrum when uh, Sinclair kind of got out of the computer business and started manufacturing the, the later models of the Spectrum. And But you can see here, it's not just the Amstrad Spectrums, but or would it be Spectra? if we want to be a little correct in the, with our Latin. But they also have uh, Amstrad's homegrown line of the, the CPC. And so we're going with the very basic 464 model, and we're going to bring that up, and there it is. So now this RX is fully in Amstrad uh, CPC mode. And now we can load a snapshot that's made for... Uh, this guy and so I got to go up the directory and then I go over to the CPC directory I should probably call it the Amstrad directory to be more uh, uh, consistent and we can see uh, we, there's a, a, a few different ways of doing it and so what you have with the um, with this this the Amstrad CPC are different graphics modes none of them are going to get you exactly what you want in text mode that we get with the uh, spectrum uh, so you, you kind of have to work around it so well, first we're going to take a look at mode one which is kind of the, uh, as close as we get with a text mode we get that same sort of um, the same sort of resolution but we're lacking the color depth so let's take a look at the program here now you notice the Sarix, it, it doesn't always look nice. It starts getting a little skippy with the uh, the text. Sometimes I gotta clear that out and I'll list it again to get a better look at it. Yeah, you know, it's it's never gonna look great. <laughs> so anyway, with uh, Amstrad, uh, it it does have to be a little bit different. Uh, the the beginning is the same as we have for the uh, the Commodore sixty four and the uh, X sixteen, uh, but uh, it does get uh, a little different once we get down to uh, two thirty. So let's uh, let's go here. Let's let's CLS and list 230 to 280. That's going to be a little easier for it to do. All right, so it doesn't start flipping out uh, until we get through this many lines. So here's where things get a bit different. So once it gets through that, uh, that nested uh, for loop where uh, it's uh, gone through however many iterations it's going to go through, and still we're going uh, up to uh, 15 iterations before calling it quits, uh, we don't have 15 unique colors in this uh, mode one. Um, we only have four, but it, it's okay. Uh, but so how we do that with the CPC is we can use the uh, this locate command, which is interesting. I, I've never seen locate in any other basic. If you know of another basic that uses locate, uh, I'd be very curious to, to find out what that was. Uh, so it does locate, and I it's a one-based coordinate system, so I have to add one to the PX and PY. Um, the course color is in uh, I, uh, so I just do the pen uh, command. Again, uh, pretty unique. Uh, so uh, that is going to determine the color. And then I do a print care 143, and this is a uh, a solid uh, the the entire character uh, space that eight by eight square is going to be that solid color, and that's how we get through the end. And then after the outermost for loop, we do another locate uh, just to get our uh, cursor. Uh, uh, below it, so we're not uh, we're not getting our ready prompt on top of what we uh, render. So let's get our, our stopwatch out because this is going to be a different one. This is not precedented. We haven't run this code in any other emulator, and uh, we're going to see how it goes. R U N and stopwatch ready and go. All right, so far so good, but you can see it's cycling through those four colors. Uh, the nice thing about a lot of these computers <clears throat> is that even if they have a limited number of colors, 
uh, especially a lot of them, these four color modes, it, you can give it a number up to 16 or up to 15 at least, and it's fine. It will, it'll just repeat those same colors as you go on. And, and the Amstrad's that way. Uh, the Atari, uh, 8-bit is, is also, uh, similar as we'll, we'll see later on in this video. All right. We're about to hit the halfway point. We are at 42 seconds right now. So it looks like, uh, we're probably on track to be about two minutes here, or probably less than two minutes. Yeah, it's going to be less than two minutes to get through this. All right. One minute and 39 seconds. So that beats all the vintage ones by a pretty substantial margin. Now, of course, being only four colors, this is not affecting the, uh, the performance because it's still doing all the same math. It just can't get as pretty a, of a picture uh, displayed. So uh, I took a look at some other ways of being able to get a more colorful fractal. And the, the most basic one was to get the uh, uh, mode zero, which uh, lets you actually have a full 16 colors, but the, the resolution is cut in half. So uh, for our, our character space is actually double wide. And so we're going to go ahead and load up the snapshot for that one. All right. And we do a little list here. And we can see here um, a bit different. Uh, up at the top, we're doing mode 0 instead of mode 1. And uh, you can see also that we've constrained uh, the X axis that we're only going 0 to 19, so just uh, 20 pixels wide, effectively. But otherwise, it's the same. We're still doing the locate and pen and printing that block. But uh, that instead of being a square block, it's now going to be a double wide rectangle. And so let's go ahead and run that. And of course, this is going to be a lot smaller. It's only going to be doing 20 comms of pixels instead of 32. So uh, this is actually, uh, this should be quite a bit faster than that mode one, because again, we're doing a lot less math. So let's R-U-N and go. So yeah, you can see very much more colorful, but big chunky pixels. Uh, again, because this is, this is still effectively a text mode version. So there we go. Yeah, we're blazing through it. We're just getting a 20 out of 32, which would be a 5 eighths the speed. So we should expect this to get in in just over a minute here. Yeah, we're about just 32 seconds there at about the halfway point. Let's see. Will it actually beat a minute? No, it shouldn't beat a minute. It should be just over a minute. That's my prediction. All right, we're coming down there. But you can see here that uh, color index uh, 14 is that light green. It's kind of an interesting palette. Uh, definitely very different from the other palettes. So let's see. We're coming down to the end. Oh, we're hitting a minute. And yep, so we are at a, uh, a minute and two seconds for this one so not too shabby right but again less computational load we're not doing all the pixels uh, but let's see uh, we can do a full resolution actually in mode zero but then we, we have to get a little fancier we can't just fill in the text uh, every uh, text character space with a solid color we have to split it up and then that means getting into how the CPC actually renders pixel graphics. So let's go back to mode one <laughs> so we can see what's going on. All right. Uh, oh, and we need to load now a different snapshot. We're going to load this mode zero pixel version. All right. So let's list out what this program is. So we're doing a mode zero still. Oh, but then it's a lot bigger. Uh, so let's let's take a, uh, a look right at the top here. So we're going to do a little CLS. 
and we're just going to list one through, uh, let's see, 150 in there and see what we get. So yeah, so it, it really starts out exactly the same. We're doing mode zero, but now we're doing PX going all the way from zero to 31. So we're going to be able to get a full 32 column uh, bitmap out of this. So now we're going to uh, go forward a bit and we're going to CLS and we're going to list uh, at 215 that breakout point through about 255. And here we can see when we get out of that, uh, that the iterations of calculations, uh, once we have that final I value that we again we subtract one from, so it's 0 to 15, or 14 rather. Uh, then we calculate a uh, address in RAM where we're going to start poking some pixels into the screen memory. And so the, the base of screen memory is uh, a decimal 49,152. It's a nice round number <laughs> when you get to uh, a hex, but again, we're, we're dealing with, uh, like most basics, we're dealing with decimal numbers here. Um, and then we take the, the Y value. We have a, in this uh, graphics mode, we have a 80 uh, pixel wide uh, display for our, our pixels. So our pixels are going to be on the, on the chunk style side. And uh, so we only got uh, 80 to, to go across. But this is a four uh, color, uh, or it's rather a 16 color version. So it's four bits per pixel. And it's a little funny the way those pixels are arranged, but as, as a result, since you have uh, two bytes uh, in there, you're going to get uh, uh, really 160 pixels wide. And so 80 bytes will be a full row of pixels. And then uh, for X, we want to, of course, multiply by two, because again, each, uh, each X value is uh, going to be uh, quite a bit uh, further out. We want to have uh, basically a four by eight pixel uh, square. <laughs> I know that sounds like a rectangle, but you remember these pixels are twice as wide as they are tall. So four, four pixels wide, eight pixels tall will actually be a perfect square. And uh, so the math works out. We need to multiply x by 2 to get each of those squares. And then we get to do some fun bit manipulation. We need to uh, figure out what the color is, and we use the percent to force it into integer math. So C percent will be a, uh, the color value as an integer. And so we are dividing it by 8. And uh, that is going to give us bit three of the, the color. And we need to uh, place that at uh, bit zero and bit one because we are, are effectively doing uh, two contiguous pixels that are next to each other in this byte. So each byte we have, uh, and it's not just the upper nibble and the lower nibble being the, the two bytes, they're interleaved in this weird sort of way. So that uh, bit three of the color is at bits uh, one for one pixel and uh, zero for the other. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we go and do an I and two, to get the um, bit uh, one uh, of the uh, color. And that we go ahead and do a multiply by two and four so that it gets uh, placed. Uh, so being at the bit one spot, it goes up into the bits uh, two and three spots. So doing an and four gets us a uh, bit two and then we multiply that by four to get it into uh, bit four and by eight and give us bit five. So bit four and five of uh, this byte is going to be the bit two of the color. And then again, we do an and one uh, and I to get bit zero of the color, which goes all the way to the top of the byte in bits seven and six. So yeah, it's a very strange mapping. I've never seen anything quite like that. And then all we gotta do is now poke this color value that we've calculated 
in, into that P address that we calculated before. So that's going to be the, uh, the upper left corner of the square that we're building. And uh, we're going to need to do all uh, 32 of the pixels in there. So uh, we uh, add one to get the next pixel over. Uh, and then uh, we add uh, 2048 to get uh, the, the pixel underneath it. Uh, so, so just doing those two pokes will get us that those uh, four pixels Y, the four double wide pixel uh, row on the top. And then adding 2048 and 2049 will get us the next row of pixels. And then so on, it goes all the way to the bottom. And if we just do a full list and it's gonna look like garbage, but that's okay. And then ultimately we do all of those pokes and so each poke is putting in two pixels, all the same color. And then again, the final locate to get us at the bottom. So after all that, we're going to actually run this thing. Let's see how fast this runs, because now this is going to get us a, a 15 color uh, fractal at the same resolution as the other platforms. So R-U-N and go. So now we can see nice square pixels uh they're you know chunky eight by eight bit guys and it's coming along fairly quickly and in fact what we should expect to see is maybe a little slower than the mode one because you can see we're doing a lot more operations uh, for each pixel it's not very heavily mathy not like doing all of those multiplications and uh, divisions over and over and over again because you can see that the rendering of each pixel is is not taking all that long and especially when we're dealing with the low iterations like on the far left side it's it's not it's not too bad so i i think we're going to get in the ballpark of uh, a minute and a half uh, we're coming down here to the first minute right now so that was one minute we're not quite uh done um so yeah we're going to get yeah i, mean, I guess it's going to be closer to two minutes all right two minutes and eight seconds so still pretty good right uh, I'm I'm still impressed. They're still faster than the Commodore 64, so that's a that's a good one on Amstrad. They they made a pretty peppy little computer back in the day. So let's uh let's see what's next. Well, let's get into America finally again, and let's do an Apple II. Now, of course, the fun thing about the Apple II, and of course, I mean that sarcastically as I do anytime I talk about Apple is that there's not really a good option for emulation on Linux. Not surprising one bit. Uh, if you're a long-term uh, Apple fan, then you are uh, probably not concerned with uh, free software by any stretch. So uh, a lot of the emulators that I've uh, I, I looked at were either uh, just... I, I, I was able to get Lin Apple to run, but getting the, uh, the basic to, to work nicely just it wasn't happening. There was an abandoned uh, emulator called Octalyzer, and it, it, was, uh, uh, it was a little flaky, and I, I couldn't quite get that to work. I couldn't get, um, I was able to run a program on there, but I, I couldn't get it to save the program, which was a, a real pain. So what I did was went to the interwebs and found a, a pretty nice version of AppleSoft Basic that runs straight on JavaScript. It's not trying to do emulation, so this is not an accurate test. But it comes with a bunch of programs on here. You can see the, the URL right here. I'll, I'll add that URL also to the description. And so if you just want to write some AppleSoft basic, now remember this is different from the integer basic that you could also get for the Apple II. This AppleSoft basic supports floating points. And 
it was a, a pretty nice basic. In fact, it supported things like this. You can see here it's doing something in 80 column mode, which is pretty impressive for a, uh, you know, a late 70s computer. Uh, so what it comes with here on the website is this demos library. And you can see in the demos, well, it's doing a Mandelbrot set. So well, how fast can we do a Mandelbrot set here? Oh, pretty damn fast, it looks like. But again, this is running as fast as the JavaScript interpreter can do it. So you can see it does, it's a little chunk style when it gets to the fatter parts of the uh, <laughs> of the inside where it's having to do all those iterations. But you know what? It looks nice. It looks like something you'd see on an Apple II screen. But it's not really uh, accurate to uh, what what I've been doing with this algorithm. This is definitely a um, optimized algorithm. It, it's not just a straight implementation of the pseudocode, which again is good for performance, but bad for comparison. So what I wanna do is load up my own. So the nice thing is, is this just loads and saves straight up text files, makes it real easy. And over here in my workspace, I've got my multi Mandelbrot. Again, apologies. Uh, the name of the repo, Mandelbrot, is spelled incorrectly, <laughs> but you know, it's free. What are you going to do? Ask for your money back? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so some of you'll see some of these later ones, like here, the uh, AppleSoft Basic. I spell Mandelbrot correctly. So if that's the kind of thing that bothers you, by all means, go ahead and fork the repo and change all the names. <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> All right, so we're going to open that, and now we can see something that looks a lot more like the uh, the basic code that we've seen before. And uh, the a few things, though, are different on the top. So uh, on that first line, instead of doing a CLS, we do a home, which sort of does the same thing, sort of initializes everything. And then in the same line, it just does a bunch of things all at once. It does a GR to get us into graphics mode. And then uh, it pokes a magic poke at 49,234. That's a magical address that when you poke zero to it, it gets us into this 16 color graphics mode. So very cool. But then you can see rest of the basic code is identical uh, right up through line 215. And then at line 230, it's just a simple plot PXPEY. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that. So the AppleSoft Basic definitely makes doing this graphics stuff super easy. So let's see here. Now, again, this is the uh, turbocharged uh, straight to JavaScript, uh, not bothering with 6502 emulation. Let's see how fast this goes. Oh, pretty nice. So here you can see we're getting something even faster than the Commander X16 does it. But anyway, that serves at least as our baseline of uh, of what uh, what should happen on the the real system, or at least on a properly emulated system. So this is a really nice thing for being able to just go ahead, put in your code, test it, and make sure it's running, and it runs it as fast as possible. Um, so let's go over here to a, a different web page because again, I couldn't get an emulator to run natively uh, for me unless it was uh, in JavaScript on a browser. But so what I did here, I was able to uh, take this uh, uh, cycle accurate emulation in uh, of the 6502 and the Apple ROM and everything in JavaScript running at, again, just over a megahertz. And what we can see here is that same exact code. I just had to type it in here and I had to load up the uh, AppleSoft basic disk image into it. And so, but there we go. We're running AppleSoft basic. We've got the program. And now we're going to get a cycle accurate rendering of it. And let's see how fast Waz's masterpiece can do this. R U N and go. So you can see here um, a bit different when we get into the uh, graphical mode. 
you can see we've get these weird uh, four lines at the bottom. That is uh, when we did that little poke that uh, took out our little uh, text field on the bottom and has just turned it all into these chunky pixels. So you can see each of these little rectangles and it's actually emulating the way that the Apple II graphics work. The colors are a little bleedy around the edges, right? They're, it, it's, it's not, they're not nice crisp uh, pixels because the, the fact that the Apple II could do color over a composite monitor is really, it's more of a side effect of uh, how it was designed and that it was really meant for monochrome composite monitors. But you get, had a color one and you could get color and you know it, it worked out pretty well. It was good enough for Sierra to make their first games on it. And uh, so yeah, you, you had Mystery House. Uh, even you, you, you couldn't even do one color if you had the color screen. You, you got those uh, purple and green artifacts around there. All right. We're hitting about the halfway point about now. We're at about a minute 25. So we're on track to get it under three minutes. So this looks like the Apple II is going to be somewhere between the Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum. So let's go ahead and fast forward to the end. All right, so we can see the little yellow and blue down there. That is our, our basic prompt now in these uh, funky color pixels. And so two minutes and 45 seconds. So, you know, not too bad for the oldest computer in this challenge. We can see now so far Amstrad CPC of these contenders is uh, really uh, leading the pack. Uh, still, uh, nobody being the Commander X16, of course, but now let's let's uh, let's stay in America. We'll do the Atari 800 now, and uh, for that, I have, uh, of course, there's the original uh, Commander X16 Basic, and then for uh, AppleSoft Basic, I had uh, written out there, um, but with the uh, Atari Basic, I I could not do that. So uh, for, again, for uh, comparison, I will uh, keep the uh, Commander X16 version up. And here is the uh, Atari version. So things, again, a bit different in Atari land. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of different graphics modes for the Atari 800. Now, the Atari 800, of course, uh, came out uh, a couple years after the Apple II. It came out at the same time as the lower cost Atari 400 that had that horrible membrane keyboard. The Atari 800 had a really nice keyboard, was a, a really nice, well built computer, and uh, and and really a a very capable computer, especially for its time coming out like three years before the Commodore 64, and uh, and really, really, a really nice underrated system. So let's take a look at, at how its basic is uh, a bit different. Now, the basic here is uh, the Atari basic that came on a cartridge. And you would uh, just pop that into the uh, left cartridge slot. <laughs> and uh, of course, the Atari 800 famously had uh, a left and right cartridge slot, and you never put anything in the right cartridge slot. So uh, later models did away with the right cartridge slot, but you'd still have that same basic cartridge, and you could put it in there, and that's how you'd run it, and then connect it to a tape recorder and eventually floppy disks and all, all sorts of other uh, cool accessories for it. So uh, you don't have for the Atari a, uh, a clear screen command. So uh, uh, not that I necessarily need it, but it's always a nice little palette cleanser at the beginning to make sure that I'm doing that uh, clear screen. And then I go into the graphics mode. The graphics mode would effectively do the same thing because doing graphics five is a pure graphical mode. It's no longer a text mode. And uh, it ends up being similar to the Apple in that it has a little band of text at the bottom. But you have access to uh, the, the colors without having to <laughs> lose your ability to see text on the bottom. And uh, so uh, you can see here, we're still going to have a uh, full uh, 32 by 22 bitmap. 
and uh, but in uh, mode five it's, it's going to be a little cramped on the screen uh, so I, I didn't I didn't fill it out in the same way that I did with the mode zero on uh, on the CPC because I, I could still get uh, you know reasonable looking pixels with just doing a single plot and uh, uh, again very uh, similar to the the way that I could do it with uh, the the apple i just just do a single plot and uh that gets us on there we do a, a little color command uh before that with i doing uh taking uh, subtracting one from i and using that for the color and then doing plot and then that plots uh, a little rectangular pixel but it's a substantial enough size that we can uh, still see it happening without having to squint too hard <laughs> so let's get ready we are going to run this puppy with the stopwatch and go. So there we go. You can see our little pixels. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. These are still square pixels, but they're a little teeny weeny. <laughs> now, uh, I, I could have uh, made this uh, a bit bigger, uh, done it up like the CPC, but uh, I think this is uh, good enough to, to get the point across. And again, kind of like with the uh, mode one for the uh, CPC, uh, we are dealing with a uh, cycling uh, four color palette. So I can uh, put in a color of 14 and it's just going to get us back to this weird uh, lime green color. This is definitely, uh, again, a very interesting four color palette with sort of a black, uh, uh, sort of a weird uh, pink a uh, uh, lime green and of a slate sort of color uh, but you can see here a minute and we're not quite halfway through uh, so this is going to be over two minutes to finish up so we're we're gonna be in uh, the, that same sort of range as the apple II. so let's see exactly where we end up All right, two minutes and 16 seconds. So it's up there and it's faster than the Commodore 64. And it came out like three years earlier. So, you know, well done Atari. And uh, I think I'd like to see also, uh, you see again, weird color screen, <laughs> color scheme, but uh, we're, this is really just only taking up a small part of the screen in this graphics mode. I think we could get much better results if we expanded this and uh, did the maximum resolution for this mode. And I think that would make a pretty nice looking fractal. And uh, it would still, it would take a lot longer. It would probably take like uh, over 10 minutes, 10, 20 minutes, but in less than a half hour, you could get uh, a, a pretty nice looking fractal here on the Atari 800. So uh, I'd say, uh, you know, very decent showings uh, from our uh, American micros, but let's go back over the pond to the Beeb. Here we go, the, the BBC. So uh, what is nice about the BBC macro is that there is a very nice emulator for it on Linux. And in fact, it kind of oversamples the text. So the text is very clear to look at. And so just really a very slick operation here for your virtual Beeb. And, uh, but what I... Uh, <laughs> What I found with our friend the Beeb is that it was a little, uh, a little uh, difficult to kind of uh, figure out what I wanted to do. So there's a few modes here. Uh, the The default one is this mode seven. It's the teletext mode, and this mode is the one that's going to get you the uh, uh, like 16 color uh, Petsky type thing, like you get with a Commodore 64. But it has some very strange limitations uh, with the teletext, as, as we will see uh, here in this code. Uh, we start out, of course, with the mode seven. We do have a CLS, but then we got to do this business here, where we uh, have to set up that array just like we did with the spectrum. Uh, Again, because what we're dealing with here are codes that we're going to have to put in 
to this uh, teletext uh, memory. This video memory has uh, codes and uh, uh, for it has you know control codes, obviously, but the control codes actually stay in the screen memory rather than just being ephemeral like they are, say, on the Commodore 64 or uh, even on the, the Spectrum. It's a very very strange sort of thing, uh, and specifically the color control codes, because uh, what you don't get in the screen memory is uh, uh, you only you don't have like a, a separate part of screen memory that is keeping track of the color of each pixel or like doing every other byte being the color information like on the Commander X16. You have to have it in line, and so that means that you can't have each uh, character being in a different color from the one previous. You have to have that color change uh, actually take up physical space on the display. Uh, so that here we have these invisible uh, character codes <laughs> that are getting put into this array. As you can see, it cycles from uh, 145 up to 152. 152 is black. And then the 145 and 151 are the rest of the colors. And here I massaged it, so I made the first and the last one black uh, for aesthetic purposes. <laughs> uh, what we aren't going to be able to do, uh, at least as I couldn't figure it out with uh, mode 7, was how to do 32 uh, pixels wide. So I have to, I have to just deal with 20 because even though we have a 40 character wide display uh, i can only change the color for every other character so we're going to have some black spots in the middle and only uh, only do 20 effective pixels but once i do get down to that it, it is nice i do this vdu statement so this is the the uh video display unit or whatever it stands for <laughs> i don't know what it stands for uh and then we put in a code this code 31 and when we put out the 31 it says all right well the next two codes you send me are going to be coordinates so i double the x value because again i need to make space for the uh, control code and then the y so i can still just put in the straight up y coordinate and then i i, I get that uh that color code uh, to put in that sacrificial character space, and then a 255, which is a uh, solid foreground block. And there it is. So there, that's how we're going to do it. And <laughs> we're going to then uh, end our loop, and this is what we get. So the nice thing about the uh, emulator is I can copy and paste code right into it so there it is so there's our, our mode 7 version and again this is, it's not going to be quite fair to run this but if we want to see how fast we can do a fractal in mode 7 that's not quite as high res as the others <laughs> high res i know uh let's see what this looks like again this is not going to be an official time so there as you can see you can <laughs> you only have every other column of uh, pixels so yeah 40 column display only 20 of which can be different colors than the guy next one and so yeah definitely a very interesting way to sort of lay out a uh, a tile map effectively um so yeah you you have that that limitation that when you do change that uh color you've got to have that empty space around it, which is kind of weird. So, you know, the, the, the Beebit has uh, additional modes where this is, is not a constraint. There are straight-up graphical modes, and I, for the life of me, could not figure out how to just do straight-up graphics with BASIC. So this is something I'm definitely going to have to do in assembly. And we're about done here, and it's, yep, at a dead-on minute. So not too bad, but again, like, uh, <laughs> like we saw before, it was uh, only a, uh, a 20 column version. 
kind of like how we had for that uh, that original version of the uh, of the CPC. So that that there's your 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 real head to head on that. So what we have now, I can do a new to clear out that program, and you can see here it, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's still nice. I can have the the color graphics and text up at the same time. Um, let me try here the mode one. Now, uh, mode one, it does support uh, graphics and text, um, but for some reason I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't get the graphics to work because it was like poke. I, I poke did not want to work. I could not play around with the poke. I, I couldn't figure out how to do that, and I couldn't get the plot commands to work the way that they appear to be documented. So this is some weird dark art about using the BBC Basic, and uh, compounded with the fact that there is a, a lot of different versions of BBC Basic that go right up to like the Acorn Risk OS machine from uh, from later in in the 80s, and yeah, it, it's it's just a giant mess. Maybe somebody out there is better with it and come up with a proper one, but this is the best I could do in uh, mode one. I could do it with pound symbols, <laughs> right? So they're not nice solid blocks. Couldn't figure out how to make them solid blocks. I know there's a way to change um, a character. Uh, you could change the way it looks like, but I, I was just uh, I was just kind of over the BBC <laughs> at this point. Love the TV programming. The basic programming uh, was a bit frustrating. <laughs> so let's. Uh, Let's paste that in there. Oh, that's still the most sound. That's the weird thing is that it doesn't seem to always get what I've copied. So let me new again. Paste. Now, all right, now we got the mode one program. And we're going to run that. And this is going to be more of a direct comparison with uh, the other one. So R U N and go. So again, a, a limitation uh, here. This will give us an accurate time comparison, but on top of having <laughs> these hash symbols, they are going to be in this uh, McDonald's color scheme. This is the default uh, color palette, uh, four color palette for mode one. Uh, to do 16 colors on the BBC, it, does, it doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> so, uh yeah this is this is as kind of as good as it gets um so yeah <laughs> let's see how how are we gonna do here are, are we hitting the uh, end of it and you notice also here i'm i'm rendering it backwards and yep yeah, so there we've passed the halfway point we're under a minute this is going to be a pretty good time but yeah uh i i had to use this uh tab <laughs> Uh, so to, uh, uh, the tab blows away everything to the left. So I had to render the, uh, <laughs> had to render the fractal, uh, going in reverse order for X going from right to left. And then that gets us, uh, this full thing. Not too bad. I'll, I'll, I'll show you here in the code in the emulator, uh, how I was able to, to tweak the program to do that. But here we're almost done. Didn't have to fast forward. I had enough to talk about. And there, yep, okay. So that was a minute 37. Not too bad. I tell you, the, the BBC is definitely impressive. The computational capability is uh, definitely enhanced because as you can see, this is running a 6502 at a full two megahertz. So yeah, we would expect it to be quite a bit faster than the Commodore 64. Really at the time when the BBC Micro came out, you, you were not getting uh, you know, uh, microcomputers that were this fast. And of course, like uh, the Apple II, it had, came with a premium price tag, uh, but that was subsidized uh, for uh, use in schools. So Apple was 
giving, uh, selling their computers to schools at cost. And the BBC Micro had government subsidies to get them into schools. Uh, so, yeah, it, it all kind of worked out that we got to have these more expensive computers for learning and trying to develop brand loyalty. It worked to a certain extent with Apple. They, they still never had a huge market share, but there was still goodwill there. And, uh, and Acorn was able to sell computers based on uh, having the same BBC Basic at home. And, and they're less expensive, uh, more scaled down models and have all the fancy uh, graphics modes but it still worked. So <laughs> let's, let's take a look at, at this maybe not so fancy graphics mode. So you can see here, uh, instead of PX for the loop index, I, I call it RX. And you see, I changed it down here to RX. And then I calculate uh, PX from that because you can't do a backwards for loop in this basic. Because when you do next on... <laughs> <laughs> on this guy on rx it's always going to increment you can't decrement in a for loop in basic at least not in any of these <laughs> versions i've seen and uh so there we get uh are the, the px value we want so starting at 31 and then counting down to zero and so it doesn't matter you don't have to do these pixels in order they can be done in a totally random order each uh, each iteration of this outer loop is independent the only de only uh iteration iteration dependency that you have is for the internal loop where you're doing those uh those uh 14 or the 15 iterations to determine the color and the color again I was just doing an I minus one. We're dealing with that four color. And then we do the tab uh, out using PX and PY and hitting the star. And so it it will, it, by doing it from right to left, blowing away the stuff, uh, all the characters to the, the left of the cursor doesn't matter because we haven't drawn those yet. And then it all works out. So, I mean, that's where we sit now. So, uh, of course, our, our big winner is the Commander X16 still. So yeah, let's just bring up our X16 emulator is still sitting at the top of the heap. And we're gonna load up our Patreon patrons. Because again, it's you guys that really help this channel run. You provide the support and you get the early access to these videos and the behind the scenes insight and support to, to really make this channel better and to, to be a part of uh, this uh, community, this retro community and doing more retro development. So I, I hope this this video inspired you to to try out some of these different basics uh, or maybe inspired you as it's inspired me to dump basic and start getting down to assembly. So that's what we're going to see when round two happens. We're going to do the assembly in a bunch of these now. Uh, the nice thing is, is that most of them are 6502 based. So the assembly for the most part is going to be the same. We just kind of have to change out the bits that deal with the graphics. And, and that's going to be relatively small. We just kind of have to kind of figure out on a, uh, on a low level how these graphics modes work. I think, for instance, the BBC Micro is going to be a hell of a lot easier to deal with on assembly because the basic was making me rip my hair out. But yeah, let's see. So what do you think? Who's going to win in round two? Uh, we'll, again, in the next video, we'll go through the whole leaderboard. We'll have all the times for everybody. And we'll be doing some comparisons. Uh, do these uh, algorithms stack up? Can we make things a little more efficient, maybe, in assembly mode? Uh, yeah, we'll take a look. But we'll still try to do this same algorithm. We're not going to do a shortcut like we saw in the Apple one we'll still go through everything so that, again, we could take this uh, this algorithm and we could use it to render different parts of the fractal rather than the entire field. And, and so it could be an off-center thing, so it's not going to be symmetrical. And that's kind of the neat thing is that then we have this sort of generic rent, uh, fractal rendering capability. All right, so if you're not subscribed, go ahead, click that subscribe button, and then click that little bell to be notified when the next episode comes out, uh, unless you're, of course, one of these uh, patrons, and you'll be notified even sooner and get the early access. But like, comment, 
and uh, just let me know what you think. Did I miss something? I know some folks had a few others that were in there. I, I didn't have my old friend, the Tandy Coco 2, uh, in the mix, uh, my first computer, but the emulation for that's also a, a bit hairy, and uh, frankly, I don't think it's going to stack up too well against uh, some of these others. So, uh, and, and again, uh, 6809 assembly is something that's going to be uh, a future part of this channel. So definitely stay tuned for that. All right. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.